I'd like to invite to the stage uh, Dr. Akum Tunalom, the Vice Minister of Natural Resources and Environment of Lao. Please welcome Dr. Tunalom. Next, I would like to invite to the stage Frankie Vijaja, Chairman and CEO of Golden Agri Resources Cinemas Group. And Group Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of OLAM, Mr. Sunny Varghese. Please join us at the stage. <coughs> I'd like to invite now Peg Putt. She's a CEO, Markets for Change. And finally, I'd like Andre Vasi, Dr. Andre Vasi, to join the stage, who is the CEO yeah. of uh, Knowledge yeah. SRM. Yeah. It's my privilege to introduce this session on green growth. And uh, first, I'd like to say a few words about our panelists and why I believe. Uh, I am privileged and all of you are very lucky to have them for this particular session. Minister uh, Akum Tunalom, the Vice Minister of Natural Resources and Environment of Laos, has a PhD in philosophy and agriculture and over 20 years of experience, not only managing but teaching the, uh, these subjects. Before this, he was the Vice Minister. Before he was the Vice Minister, he was also Chairman of the Economic and Finance Committee of uh, the Lao National Assembly. So, Minister Tunalong, another word of applause for you. The green economy is also about green business, and we have two business representatives here. Frankie Vijaja, who is, of course, as I mentioned, the CEO of Golden Agri Resources of Cinemas, has a remarkable and laudable target of achieving a fully 100% certified palm business by 2015. Golden Agri Resources is, of course, the second largest world's uh, oil palm producer, uh, so that's not a small target in that sense. Uh, Frankie has uh, distinguished himself also as the vice chair and earlier chair of the uh, agri and food side of Kadin, and uh, he chairs the Indonesian Palm Oil Board. Applause for thank you, Vijay. Sunny Verghees is uh, chief executive of Olam, and he has constantly promoted the message that maximizing the intrinsic value of companies can be achieved only by respecting sustainability principles. So I think that is very much the kind of thinking that we'd like to hear about today. Olam, his company, is a global agribusiness and it integrates the management of entire supply chains and the processing of agricultural products, food products. Peg, I'd like to commend you for uh, being here with us all the way from Tasmania, where you were a member of parliament for 15 years. And uh, you've worked a lot in the field of the environment and you also are a recipient of the Tasmanian Honor Roll of Women in, in the Service of the Environment of 2011. Thank you for being here. Andrea Bassi, as CEO of Knowledge SRL, is a researcher in this whole area of understanding how to model economies into our future. Uh, he works on system dynamic modeling, and whilst based in Switzerland, he is an extraordinary professor of system dynamic modeling at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. A word of applause for Andrea Bassi. Friends, the topic that we are discussing today, which is green growth in Southeast Asia, is close to my heart. My own background as leader of the Green Economy Initiative for the United Nations Environment Program and the study leader of TEAB was very much about the heart and center of natural capital and its role in green growth. And the idea that the way that we manage our economies today 
is not one that can continue into the future. We have heard that from President Yudhiyono, we have heard that from the, the ministers who spoke earlier, and you hear, you're hearing that from our panel. When we say green growth, what we really mean is the kind of growth that will be seen in tomorrow's economy. And frankly, tomorrow's economy has to be a green economy. An economy which, in the United Nations, we have defined as an economy that delivers well-being whilst improving social equity, which means narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor, and at the same time, not increasing environmental risks like climate changing emissions or pollutants and poisons, and not worsening ecological scarcities like soil fertility or freshwater availability. That kind of economy requires a different sort of management approach. It requires much more collaboration and cooperation between governments, as we have heard, between the private sector. The private sector is two-thirds of GDP and jobs. It is not really feasible to talk a language of a different economy without talking the language of a different private sector. I call that new company, new, that new corporation, Corporation 2020, a visionary, forward-looking corporation, but actually, which is needed now, by 2020, in order to be able to deliver the changes that we talk about. A lot is being, being discussed in setting the sustainable development goals, but we must remember that when we talk about sustainable development, these goals are not only productivity goals, which companies can and know how to deliver, on their own, but there are also inclusion goals which relate to equity, which means making sure that there is progress for all. And at the base of this pyramid, there are the resilience goals, the whole idea that we must have security in the environment in order to be able to do business at temperatures which make sense with soil fertility and fresh water availability that is, uh, that is real and continues into the future. And indeed, security Politically and socially, at the end of the day, we don't want to be in a world which is fraught with terrorism and wars and tragedy of a human kind that is also completely against the principle of a green economy. With this quick background, um, and knowing that managing economies and working with, with governments is critical, I would like to learn how Lao has fared in its uh, belief and progress towards green growth and a green economy. Vice Minister, your country has uh, 40 or 50 percent forest cover. Uh, hydroelectricity is a huge part of, of your energy uh, supply. Enforcement of forest conservation is a huge challenge. Tell us, in Lao, what kind of uh, economy do you uh, envisage today and into the future, and what is your experience? We would like to hear about it. Dr. Peter Hogan, Minister, <coughs> distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Laupedia had been a country with rapid economy and our target to leave the least developing country by 2020. <coughs> our natural resources, biggest assets, big forest cover about more 40% with the large mineral deposits and with minerals tributary of the Mekong providing hydropower potential. With a vast potential of the power, we envision to become the battery of the Southeast Asia providing clean energy for our own development and also for the rising energy demand for our neighboring, becoming the battery of Southeast Asia. It linked to our ability 
g o n to increase the forest cover 70 percent by 2040. 2040. We acknowledge the necessity to protect our watershed and biodiversity. Still today, Lao have decided. 6.6 million hectare protection forest, 3.5 million hectare conversation forest, and 3.3 million hectares production forest. <coughs> Much had to be done to actively manage these resources. How step are underway to address the challenges we are facing? Environmental protection law has been passed last year by our National Assembly. Land policy, land law, and forest forest law are currently revised. We also now. On case of the EU in the forest law on function, governance, and trade process, and want to negotiate with a voluntary partnership agreement to and address illegal logging in the country and <coughs> sustainable forest management and trade and commerce of tinder product through forest certification have been promoted by the government. To promote the deeper forest certificate, just as FCC and the national FLECT process can unite stakeholders in the quest for the increasing green economy. It can address the fair trade, the need to balance the social, cultural, economic, and environmental dimension of development, and environmental concern for biodiversity and carbon rich forest. To promote the marketing of non food product, forest product, and to removing barrier to the market entry of green forest product from the Laopedia as an in getting the poverty reduction strategy, and also the government is piloting race plots and payment for ecosystem service which would translate into opportunity to the new resource for the conservation and restoration of the forest as part of the green growth process in the forest sector. That the policy which the government Lao Kaben will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Mr. Vijaja, your company has uh, a huge presence and also tremendous goals towards sustainability. Uh, tell us how you plan to achieve this and tell us your experience. And also, uh, it would be good to hear your thoughts on any new market mechanisms or financing mechanisms that would help you to get there. Thank you, Papan. Distinguished guests, the distinguished delegates, participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for C4 for organizing this timely conference and inviting me to join this important forest dialogue. We live in a world where the countries have more and more mouth to feed. 
with fewer and fewer resources. We need to create employment and we need to conserve forests. We also have businesses to run for which we need to grow shareholders' value. So how, we do, how do we find the solution to achieve the ultimate bottom line for our people, planets, and profits? When you come to the country which you have 40% of the Southeast Asia tropical rainforest, all eyes and many fingers are pointed at you. But you all know that it is not just Indonesia or palm oil. Everyone in this room has a vital role to play. We collectively face the challenges and we need to find solutions in consultation with each other. That's why this C4 Summit is very important. We at Gordon Agri are, the palm oil, are in palm oil business. The industry plays a vital role in Indonesia economy. It is strategic pillars, and it provides jobs for more than 5 million people. In 2013, palm oil contributed 11 billion US dollars and counted for 10% of Indonesia's non-oil and gas export. When the Asia financial crisis hit in '98, many businesses collapsed, but palm oil industry stood firm. It, it continues to provide livelihood for people, revenue for Indonesia, and profit for businesses. Palm oil plays a significant part in our lives. For Indonesia, it ensures that the country, which has 250 million people to feed, Indonesia exports its palm oil to worldwide, including back to some African countries where it first came from. So now, so how do we leverage the natural blessing of the amazing palm oil tree? How do we ensure palm oil does not lead to deforestation? The forests are Indonesian national treasure, while it's our heritage. These forests are also an essential part of the global ecosystem. To conserve high carbon stocks forests, Gordon Nagri has initiated a multi-stakeholders platform involving stakeholders like TFT and Greenpeace. We also are, are encouraged by other industry players who have now adopted similar commitments. But this multi-stakeholders genius has its challenges. For instance, the collectively shared, we collectively shared the lack of one map. While good work has been done in, to map Indonesia forests and natural resources, I believe that having one map will unleash Indonesia potential. Without it, opportunistic player can wriggle out through the cracks and op operate without being sustainable. We can fix this when we work together to tighten the gaps of one undisputed map. One map will benefit all stakeholders. Finally, we also need practical initi initiative to smallholders who accounted for 43% of about 4 million hectares of total, 9.2 million hectares of palm oil plantation in Indonesia. Independent smallholders have limited access to financial support and technology know-how, and this contribute to low yielding, contribute to their poor performance. If you look at it, low productivity is mainly due to low, the low yielding inferior seed, improper fertilizer application, and a poor plantation management. So now, along with our concerted effort on the conservation and sustainability front, we also have innovative financing scheme for our smallholders to increase their productivity. This in turn helps them in, to improve the livelihood and reduce the pressure to open more land. Kadin, the Indonesia Chamber of Commerce of and Industry, the organization which is close to my heart, and I have served as Kadin Vice Chairman for Agriculture and Food for more than eight years now. We have, lim we have invited an exciting financing scheme for some one million independent oil palm smallholders to receive funding through cooperatives. With this in financial support, farmers replanting their existing palm oil plantation and will be assisted <coughs> through the initial four years that they need to wait 
to harvest their palm trees. The garden scheme could mean tripling yield in, and resulting in additional production of five to six million tons of oil from smallholders. This translates into an additional income of up to five billion dollars a year, and more importantly, through this scheme, we could avoid opening one million hectares of new land for palm oil development. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to secure a better future for people, forests and business, all of us need to do our part. I'm confident that through multi-stakeholders collaboration, we'll find solutions for sustainable palm oil and converting, conserving our precious forests. Thank you. That was a fascinating example you gave of Thank the Cadden scheme, um, uh, Frankie. And what you're saying is essentially a tripling of yield is possible with the right inputs and the right management. Yes. And that as a result of that, your uh, smallholders, the 43% who, who comprise uh, 4 million hectares, roughly, of, Four million hectares. Hectares of land. But 43% of the planted area. Of, of the panel. And they could actually be tripling their yield. Now, this is not dissimilar to some studies done on food in sustainable food practices around the world, study in 2006 and again by the FAO in 2009, suggesting that a doubling of yield was not dreaming, it was reality, it was possible. But tell me, what, and this is, uh, how do you see this finance? What is the, the way of supporting this? What, how will the money flows happen to ensure that these smallholders actually receive the financing in time and are able to uh, implement the new practices that you speak of? Thank you. So basically, the yield today is about two ton to two and a half tons per mm -hmm. hectare. Yeah. And for them to replant, because this is their only source of income, for them mm -hmm. to replant, they need uh, to be financed uh, during this four years period, during the pre-planting period. Mm -hmm. So our so-called innovative financing is addressing these issues. And uh, economically, it's also very sound, because mm -hmm. if two million hectares that is very uh, low yield hmm. that we're going to replant. A normal replanting is about $4,000. If we add uh, interest during construction plus the cost of living during four years, hmm. that would be around $8,000. Hmm. So it will be about $16 billion needed to fund this 2 million hectares replanting. Hmm. And economically, basically, if three, uh, five to six million ton increase times 100, at hundred dollars, hmm. it would be about five billion dollars in five billion, four yeah. to five billion dollars increase. Right. So uh, I think no-brainers that about four years this re this uh, fin uh, finance will be returned. But certainly we will not return in four years because yes. yeah. uh, the farmers also need some income. Hmm. So we will stretch that about uh, eight to nine years basically. Mm -hmm. So this uh, we already discussed with the government. Uh, mm. all the, uh, we have launched that last September mm. Uh, mm. with the coordinating ministers. And thank you for all the uh, some of the ambassador also joining all this uh, kickoff meeting. Very good. Yes. And are the banks supporting this? Yes. We, this? we also That's in the good. World Economic mm. Forum. Mm. Yes. Uh, we have launched this so-called sustainable agriculture, right. uh, so-called PISA Agro mm -hmm. partnership for Indonesia agriculture, uh, mm. green uh, agriculture. So uh, we have many other crops similar to this, uh, using innovative financing also. Excellent. Well, keep fingers crossed and may, may it succeed. <laughs> yes, we'll Thank make you. our fat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So. Sunny, uh, we just heard one example of, uh, sure. uh, if you like, a supply chain component, which yeah. is part of the, yeah. the palm, um, potentially increasing its yield with the right kind of support yeah. and, and technology and advice. Uh, your whole business is the entire value chain yeah. of, of food. Tell us, when we're looking towards green growth and a green economy and working in a way that business does not deliver higher negative impacts but positive impacts, in yeah. fact, yeah. how would you go about it with Olam? What right. would be your challenge? How would you go about it? Tell us about it. So, Pavan, with your permission, let me just set the context a bit and I'll answer your Please. specific question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I believe there are four major developmental challenges that we face this century, and that's about food security, water security, impact of climate change, and energy security. And all these four major developmental challenges, while it's a complex problem, is got, has got interrelated and interlocked causes. It is therefore a bit disappointing when you go to conferences like this, we address this very piecemeal, 
single issues that we take at a time, but that's not going to solve the overall problem. So unless we can have an integrated solution to these major developmental challenges, we are unlikely to make any sustainable long-term breakthroughs. The food security issue, I think we all know about the drivers. We have a growing population, it was mentioned, 70 million people being added to the world each year. They all need to be fed. It's not a new problem, we have coped with it well in the past. But what is game-changing that we have not seen in our lifetime is there is increasing prosperity in the transitioning economies and a huge middle class emerging. In 2010, we were 1.8 billion people in the middle class. By 2030, we expected to be 4.8 billion. Roughly 3.03 billion people are being added to the middle class. 90% of that will be in India and China, mm. and a lot in this part of the world. In the Western and developers, very little additional growth in the middle class. They all need to be fed, but more importantly, there is increase in calorie consumption. Mm. As a rough rule of thumb, people in low-income countries consume 2,600 calories per capita. Middle income, it is 3,000, and high income, it is 3,600. So there's at least a 20% growth in calorie consumption that we're going to see in India in the next 20 years. Mm. And mm. same in China. I don't believe that India and China have a reasonable prospect of feeding itself in 10, 15 years' time. This might be a provocative statement, but that, I believe, is the fact. Mm. The third issue is there's a revolution in dietary habits, from a cereal carbohydrate-based diet to protein and fat-based diet. In the mid-80s, China consumed 15 kgs of meat per capita. Today, it's 55 kgs. The Western world consumes about 120 kgs of meat per capita. And we said China and India can never eat as much meat as the Westerners do. Mm. Taiwan and Hong Kong, which are greater parts of China, consume 100 kgs of meat per capita. It's all about prosperity. If you can afford it, you will eat more of these protein and fats. The fourth issue that we are seeing is urbanization and the impact of urbanization. There's a revolution in urbanization. India has hit 30% urbanization rates this year. China has hit 51% this year. Africa is 40%. Latin America is about 70%. Urban population consumes roughly three times mm. the meat per capita as rural populations, and about three and a half times dairy products as rural populations. So China today consumes 40% of all the pork that is produced in the world, 30% of all the eggs that is produced in the world. And that is a step out of change, both in demand and therefore the direction of prices. Mm. If you take the 30-year price history of wheat, wheat between 1970 and 2000 declined by minus 23 percent. Between 2001 and 2013, it grew at 208 percent. Corn declined by 23 percent in the 30-year period and has now grown by about 230 percent in the last 13 years. Rubber declined 55% in the 30-year period. It has now grown 350%. And this is not being really noticed and seen. There's a step order change in food, feed, fiber prices, and that trend is going to continue as there is going to be a growing demand-supply imbalance as we go forward. And as if all this was not tough enough, we shot ourselves in the feed by diverting more and more food and feed raw materials into biofuel manufacturing. 40% of the U.S. corn crop got diverted into biofuels. 52% of the Brazilian sugarcane crop went into ethanol manufacturing. 10% of all world oil seeds last year went into biofuel manufacturing. And on the supply side, we have serious constraints. We have declining arable land, 0.8% in China every year. If you look at the urban crop, crawl and the satellite maps, you will see that there is significant loss. If you look at the Chinese 12 five-year plan estimates, they want food self-sufficiency, which is defined by them as 95% of the food they should produce themselves, which needs 124 million hectares of land. They probably now got about 116 million hectares of land under cultivation, and that is going to further decline. Just as a result of their urbanization, China today has roughly 80 million fleet population. This was a 2010 number. Based on 14 million cars being added in the last four years, they'd have gone to about 130 million cars. At eight, Chinese fleet intensity in terms of number of cars per thousand people is still today only about 58, compared to the US of 790, compared to a world average of 148 cars per thousand people. Even if China just achieves the world average, it's going to treble its car population. What is the impact on food production? Every car that is added to the fleet population, you have to set aside 0.08 hectares of land 
for supporting that car in terms of the roads and in terms of the parking lots and the spaces that are required. Which means China, if it projects to get to about 150 cars per thousand population, which is just the world average, and there's an estimate out there which says Chinese fleet population will go to 630 million cars in 25 years' time. But let's not go there. Just 150 million cars, 50 million hectares would be taken out of cultivation. On the four major food crops, China has 90 million hectares under cultivation. Why is China today the world's largest importer of soybean? Because it has got a water constraint and a water issue. And the best way to import water is to import a cape size full of soybeans <laughs> from, from South that's America. That's right. Water is a major issue. We today consume 4.5 trillion cubic meters of water. 71% of that is for agriculture. In the northeast part of China, water tables are receding at 4 meters per year. In the northwest part of India, water tables are receding at 6.5 meters per year. China has about 8%, 22% of the world's population with 8% of its water. And India has about 20% of the world's population with about 9% of its water. If we can fight a war over oil, be prepared for bigger geopolitical conflicts on water, on food. So how do you solve this problem? It therefore has to be a holistic problem. There are some in this room who will say, all big agriculture is bad. And it's only small scale agriculture that is good. I don't think that is a balanced view. I think you need both systems to sub coexist, large scale farming systems as well as small scale farming systems. From a practitioner's point of view, we are today probably the most diversified upstream agribusiness company globally. We have invested in 19 upstream plantation and farming projects in 22 countries. So we grow almonds in Australia and in California. We grow coffee in Brazil, in Zambia, in Tanzania, in Ethiopia, and in Laos. We grow uh, rubber in Cote d'Ivoire, in Nigeria, in Liberia, in Ghana. We grow grains in Argentina. We grow grains in Russia. We do dairy farming in Uruguay. We do dairy farming in Russia. We have forest concessions in the Republic of Congo. So from a practitioner's point of view, I think there are a lot that we, there's a lot that we can do. Let me give you just one example. We grow onions in California. And in onions, we grow onions for not table purposes, for dehydration. We have over the last 10 years through research, improved solid content in onion from 13, 14% to 26.5%. In China today, solid content for onions is about 13%. In India, is at about 12%. Which means we have saved roughly on the acreage that we grow to process tomatoes. And we have got the third largest tomato processing capacity in the US. For the area that we grow, we have saved about 65 million cubic meters of water. And we have saved $88 million in terms of costs. And we have reduced 7,500 hectares from cultivation to meet our factory's capacity requirements. That's just one example. And we've got 170 such programs that we are running. But as was mentioned by Frankie, in all our large-scale agricultural systems, it is only a sideshow. Your nucleus farm or your main farming operation is only a sideshow. The bigger part of the activity is really the outgrow program that you're uh, embedding into your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, where we grow rice on 4,600 hectares today, which we will take to 10,000 in large scale mechanized farm with ADL seeding and mechanized harvesting, mm -hmm. we have 10,000 farmers in a small outgrow program whose yields have gone up from 1.8 tons to three and a half tons per hectare. Mm. The way we can create true value is to transform their livelihoods by enhancing their productivity, but mm. they can't increase their productivity in a vacuum. They need to see best practice, mm. good agricultural practice, and it has to be a seamless exchange mm. in order to be able to catalyze that. Mm. Lovely examples, and I completely agree with you that you know, we tend to box and silo our issues, food security, energy security, climate change, and water security. But I think also equally we sometimes box issues in terms of environmental issues, people issues, and yeah. economic yeah. issues. And I think um, let's not fall prey to that. So let me just ask you immediately that uh, what we are speaking about in terms of productivity gains, which is of course absolutely one of the components towards sustainability, how can we ensure they reach the bottom of the economic pyramid? 
Why do we say this? After all, 70% of poverty today is in rural agricultural areas. There are one billion jobs which are basically yeah. small-scale agriculture. Yeah. 400 million farms around this world are less than two hectares. So yeah. These are tiny farmers and yet they employ and feed. And also 80% of the food that is received by food insecure regions comes from these areas, from these small farms. So where's the connect? How can we ensure that the kind of uh, approach and technology and expertise that you speak of, which delivers higher productivity, yes. is actually available right down yes. to the bottom of this yes. pyramid yes. so that the jobs are there? Yeah. You know, so we don't only talk productive, but also yeah. employment and, and equity. Yeah, it's a very good point, Paul. Yeah. So in the 65 countries that we are present, we touch mm. directly or involved directly with three and a half million farmers. Mm. Now, we offer them eight things as part of our OLAM livelihoods charter because we believe it is easy for us to go into these countries and get licenses from the government to operate. Mm. But it's damn difficult to get a license from the community to operate. Most of these long-term plantation projects that you set up have useful lives of 30, 40, 50 years, in the case of pistachios and walnuts, 50 and 60 years. So it's not about going in there, making a fast buck and getting out of the country. Mm. So if you want to really survive long-term in the country, you need the license from the communities to operate. That's far more difficult to get in these countries than just getting a government license to operate. Mm. So uh, if you look at the eight things that we do, firstly, we provide microfinance mm -hmm. and we provide interest-free loans. We cost it as a part of a cost of production, but we provide the farm because the first thing in emerging markets, tough emerging market geographies, is the lack of rural finance. Mm, mm, absolutely. The second thing that we provide is uh, a whole uh, extension services package mm. that allows him to improve his productivity. Mm. So we work directly, we have now uh, worldwide about uh, 2,000 extension officers, mm. trained agricultural mm. uh, graduates and postgraduates mm. who, uh, who uh, get the farmers to come to that good practice that we want, sure. which is uh, in their context relevant. The third is we look at quality upgradation. So if the farmer, we can convert him to produce more organic, organically certified raw materials or more traceable raw materials or more customized grades of qualities, we can get a significant premium. Today, when we supply organic cashew, mm. we get an 80% premium over mm. in organic cashew. Mm. And we can supply and share that with the farmers. With the farmers, excellent. So yeah. that is the third thing that we do. The fourth mm. thing that we do is mm. labor practices. Mm. So it is natural in some of these environments for family, all of them to work on the farm. To make sure that they ensure that the children go to school mm. and they are not forced on the farms mm. is a major effort and mm. a huge mm. task. Sure. So that is the fourth thing right. that we do. So there are eight things that we do. We won't have time to go yeah, through all of yeah. that. That's good. And that catalyzes the livelihoods, which is yeah. more important for us. Great to hear that because in a sense, this is the connect. This is how it goes down. Give my, provide microfinance, provide education, provide quality related advice, provide labor support. And, and market access. Market access, absolutely. Yeah. I know we're talking a lot about food, but I think given that food is also 30% of climate change impact, if you take agriculture, food, and everything that supports it, uh, and given that it is a pretty important part of our lives, uh, let's stay with that for a moment, but go from the supply side to the demand side. Peg, you've had a long career in environmental uh, uh, sort of activism, if I may say, in the broadest possible sense, but also in governance as an MP. and. Uh, you come from a different part of the world. What role does the, con what role does the citizen play when she becomes the consumer? H how, does, how does that equation work in creating a green economy and sustainability? I think it's a very important uh, question to address. When we look at the concept green growth, when you hear the words, or what I do, I think, well, that's totally contradictory. It's an oxymoron, one of my favorite words. Um, for growth to become green, mm. we, we obviously need to decouple it from increasing material consumption and in particular from runaway consumption of natural resources. And we've all seen the slides up here uh, this morning around, around the types of uh, problems with just escalating uh, d uh, degradation and destruction of natural ecosystems and escalating demand, escalating production. I think the important thing to understand, of course, is this is happening in a globalised way and that there 
it's a, in response to demand from developed countries and from the large cities in Asia. We've got globalised trade and investment, um, which is driving large-scale projects and these changes, uh, especially in pulp and paper, mm -hmm. in mining, in rubber and in oil palm in this region. We can't resolve those problems solely on the supply side or by thinking just out of what we do on the supply side. I'm not saying the supply side isn't important, it's very important. And um, there are a range of uh, things that have already been talked about and that we'll hear it through the two days about what we can do to make production more environmentally sustainable. But even if you do that in one place, as long as you've got this massive demand uh, coming down the line, then you'll just get displacement or leakage, as it's mm. called in the uh, climate talks. Mm. Uh, so that uh, you might fix it in one place on the supply side and the pressure just moves somewhere else, you get all yeah. the destruction, finally get your act together, or it's gone and it moves on to the next place and so on. And, and that's, of course, the tragedy for our planet. Uh, so you have to tackle demand. How do you do it? Well, I think the first... There are a number of things that, that can be done. The first one is to create a presumption in the opposite direction, mm. by which I mean mm. pay to keep it mm. rather mm. than paying mm. to chop it down or mm. dig it up or whatever you do and take it away. That's where the concept of uh, red plus comes in, mm -hmm. paying to maintain mm. the forests. And um, hopefully we can get to those other uh, carbon-rich ecosystems like mangroves as well, or maybe we could pull them in under red. I remember trying to talk about that um, about five years ago at the Climate Talks and people thought I was a bit loopy, but um, the time is coming. Uh, and, uh, and all the other ecosystem services, they are really vital, they're really important uh, for people, they're also important uh, just simply intrinsically. Uh, and, and if we can get money landing to keep them there, then good. Mm. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I think we have to address the drivers, the underlying causes. And yes, there are a lot of people uh, who obviously need to be able to move out of poverty and will um, along the way be consuming more. But there are also an incredible number of people on the planet who are indulging in wildly inappropriate overconsumption. And we have to do something about it. We actually have to restrain that type of lifestyle. And a lifestyle which is causing them ill health as well. Well, as yes, a side, it's a, exactly. As a side benefit, exactly. In fact, the way health links in with all of this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, so, what can you do about that? Well, in my experience, uh, there are a number of things. Um, you act in the markets, you actually address with people something that our uh, interesting speaker from Singapore talked about earlier uh, accountability, responsibility. Responsibility is not just something that has to be taken by producing companies. Responsibility has to be taken by consumers and by retail companies. And, uh, and the way I've, I've done it is with the carrot and stick approach. Uh, for companies, they have a reputation, they want to maintain a brand. Uh, increasingly, because of consumer awareness, uh, that means that they want to be seen to be doing the right thing about forests and uh, natural ecosystems. And so, uh, if, if they're encouraged, if they do, do the good thing, mm. okay, they get accolades. Do the bad thing, reputational damage will come. Mm. And so, um, too, with consumers, many people feel very disempowered mm. by the slow rate of change and the slowness in developed countries of their governments to commit to making real reductions in mm. carbon emissions. And they want to do something themselves. Mm. This mm. is where they can act. And they can act back down the supply chain, mm. talking to the retail companies. That goes back down to the suppliers and so on about what is actually acceptable in the market. And we've had some very big successes with this. Also, you can act on investment in a similar way. You talk to investment banks uh, about what is their policy and why. You make sure that they're informed about what's going on. They're often not aware, of course, of the minutiae around the environmental aspects of the investments they might be making in a company and that company's activities. So that's a, another really important one. And of course, if it's a bank that ordinary mums and dads bank with, then you've got 
the stick that you can use as well. And, and then, of course, there are just talking to the companies themselves about company policies. It's very important that there are companies who are leaders. It's also important to deal with those who are laggards. And shareholder um, Activ uh, activism, activism yes. is very, very important. Uh, I think I could go on, but those, that's a taste of uh, the type of thing to be done on the demand side. That's great. Thanks very much for adding that. And also for questioning, as you did right at the beginning, and growth. What do we mean by growth? Because uh, if all we're achieving is demand growth, then that may not achieve sustainability. It certainly would not be green. Uh, well, I uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they have TV shows in Australia about how awful it is to have too much stuff. Yeah. Well, it is awful, mm. but it's not just because it clutters up your house. Mm. It's much more important more, than that. Yes, yeah. and, and I think there's a, a fundamental soul searching to be done as a result of, uh, again, uh, what we heard from Singapore. If you have transparency, then mm. you can ha have accountability, but you can also have awareness. Yeah. So education and awareness and encouraging people to action and actually giving them things that they can do simply in their lives and simply to feed back to companies and to producers, very, very important and very powerful. When you get that happening at scale, you get a result. Excellent. Now, another dimension, which is capital. And when we talk green growth and green economy, what we really want to grow is wealth and the economic measurement of wealth, whether it is human wealth, intellect, skills, future incomes, or whether it's wealth in terms of nature and its bounties. It's about capital. Capital is the economic term for wealth. Andrea, you've worked on this whole issue of modeling different paths in the economy to see what's their impact, these different policy paths, on the overall capital in the economy. So what is your take on this? Do you, do you think it's possible, for example, to model a path which is green, is inclusive, it's supportive of the bottom of the pyramid, it is sustainable? on the one hand, and on the other hand, modeling a path which is business as usual, what we are doing today, and coming to clear answers. Is this possible? Have you done it? What does it look like? Yes, thank you, Pavan. I'll go for the short answer because the long one may take a week. <laughs> no, no, I don't need, only have to give you three minutes for you. <laughs> yes. so it, is, it is certainly possible. Yeah. I think when we talk about green economy and green growth, the concept may be new, but the interventions are not new. Yeah. So that's something we need to recognize. We talked about energy efficiency, water efficiency, sustainable forest management for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what is really innovative is the type of analysis we need to do to assess these green economy and green growth interventions. So often we start with looking at investments. Yeah. Erroneously, we call them costs of action, but yeah. they're really investments. Yeah. These normally accumulate in built capital, manufactured capital, which is normally what we are able to track very well. On the other hand, we need to consider also what are the avoided costs that are being driven or generated by investing in green economy interventions. Right. Now, these are potentially the avoided loss in ecosystem services. So we're really talking about natural capital. Mm. When we lose ecosystem services, we need to replace them, and that requires further investment. So it is really an avoided cost. And that's something we have analyzed for a long time with energy efficiency. Mm. You invest in energy efficiency to reduce the cost of running a car, running your factory, and so on and so forth. The third item to look at is the added benefits. Mm. Often we say that the economy has to be pro-jobs and mm. pro-poor, like yes. in the case of Indonesia. So in this case, we are talking about potentially creating new and additional jobs mm. that take care of what is the social and the human capital, right. building in also the knowledge that supports productivity and competitiveness and so on. What is really interesting then at this point is to consider how this type of information can contribute to policy formulation and assessment, mm. Mm. recognizing that there are impacts that can be felt or outcomes that emerge within one sector, that could be energy or forestry or water and so on and so forth. Mm. But there are also impacts that emerge across actors. So we have the public sector, the private sector, sure. we have yeah. households, we have the poor living in forests so and highly biodiverse yeah. areas. So this would only be possible if you had a full economy model, input output model which covers the entire economy, where your modeling is changed based on different policies and investments from one type of economic outcome to the other. Yes, right. potentially being a dynamic model that yeah. accounts for the short, medium and longer right. term of policy interventions is this what you're doing across with, dimensions. And is this what you're doing with the UNDP project, the low emissions capacity yes. building project? It, it's, a, it's an evolving process. Mm -hmm. Concepts are getting firmer. Mm -hmm. uh, one challenge in my work, I've 
supported about 20 countries in dealing with green economy and green growth planning mm. across planning processes, budgetary processes, medium to longer term and vision mm. type of exercises. Mm. And the challenge is that every country is unique. Mm. It has a social, economic and environmental context that is unique. Absolutely. So we're, we're doing interesting work here in Indonesia mm. uh, to support the assessment on what the green economy or green growth means mm. at the provincial level as well as at the national level, mm. how processes can be improved to become more comprehensive to assess the impacts or the outcomes, positive and negative, because we know there are side effects that will be emerging. Yes. So the, the yeah. trick is to yeah. anticipate these potential side effects and assess what the consequences are simultaneously on the built capital, on the natural capital, and the social and human capital. So truly an integrated approach of yes. the kind of, yeah. uh, if you like, testing out in measurement terms, in a planner's thinking and in an economic yeah. uh, analyst thinking, yeah. what are the outcomes? And I think that, that is great. So I think uh, I, it's very difficult to summarize such a rich uh, discussion, but I'll just say that we have gone from uh, the perspective of how do we manage an overall country economy in Southeast Asia, from Vice Minister from Lao to how does sustainability get embedded into the actions of a company from both of you, all the way down to looking down the value chain and looking to different levels of society. Recognizing that green economy is also about ensuring sustainable production and consumption. We had Peg's views on sustainable consumption, how to engender that, and the role of uh, uh, education and, and uh, uh, exemplification and awareness. And also then finally, the planner's toolkit. How do you measure anything as complex as green economy? And what Andreas says suggests that it is possible. In fact, he's working on it. I really want to uh, open, before I thank the panel, I think there's probably time for one or two questions from the floor. If there are burning questions, can they raise their hand and can someone take uh, a microphone to them? A person right over on the right there. Uh, person right at the end on the right hand side, the gentleman there, yes, yes. Can you just stand up? And first you and then the gentleman in front. Um, so can someone take a microphone to the gentleman at the end? So please remember, uh, the rule that I have for questions is there have to be tweet length. <laughs> Your question has to be tweet -landed. Everyone in Jakarta is the Twitter capital of the universe. <laughs> so you know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> Can someone please take a microphone to the gentleman at the end? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my Thanks. name is Faisal Parrish from uh, Global Environment Center, working with the ASEAN Secretariat on the issue of transboundary haze and peat fires. Uh, my question is to uh, Freddie Wajaja. Earlier today, we heard the challenge from the Singapore minister. How do we get everyone working together in partnership, private sector, government, civil society? Uh, you have mentioned uh, some of the initiatives uh, that you have worked about financing for smallholder, but still we are having major problems and we had in Rio earlier this year. Uh, I understand that for GAR, you've been able to minimize the problem of peatland fires on your lands, but how can you play a role to spread that to much larger landscapes around your operation? How can you work with other stakeholders, and what are the challenges to that in creating a fire and haze-free environment for okay. peatland development? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, for Golden Agri, we have uh, already put the policy for non-peatland uh, non uh, plantation for uh, already more than three, four years. And, and basically, the government uh, still allow uh, plantation up to three meters depth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, I think, uh, these are the, the, uh, uh, the things that maybe the policy yes. issues that need to be revisited. Uh, the other part uh, is basically, um, for those areas which is, um, they, I think a lot of the smallholders are still, still uh, doing the, the, what you call it, the uh, uh, stress and burns. Uh, we're not uh, practiced basically, and, and the initiative that we have for a million hectares, uh, for two million hectares replanting, uh, to increase their, their 
productivity and their income. Hopefully, that will reduce uh, the uh, for them to to wanted to plant more in other areas uh, where it's actually a conserved areas also. So these are the things that I think we are working very closely with the government uh, to uh, simultaneously increase their productivity, increase their income, uh, reducing those areas where it's already prohibited, and also certainly is the um, capacity building, how to make sure that they understand the good agriculture practice. So these are the concerted effort as a totality, how we address these issues. And, uh, uh, we see some progress, but uh, the weather is not helping us. Uh, we understand that El Nino is coming 70-75% uh, uh, predic predic prediction that's going to come uh, later, later half of this year. We hope we are now preparing uh, how to reduce the, 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 the effect on this El Nino. Thanks. Thanks for answering. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about agriculture and food, and I've been reminded that lunch approaches. So it is now my, my privilege to uh, thank our speakers. Andrea, thank you. Peg, excuse thank me. you. Hello, excuse yes. me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Do there's I still have the one. To speak? You'll have to I'm really sorry. be very quick. Quickly, then we can have one quick answer. Okay. Very quick to Mrs. Uh, uh, Peg, but um, I'm really interested in your point and your solution on uh, pay to keep rather than pay to cut the trees. Uh, before that, my name is Garland, and I'm from the World Resources Institute, Indonesia. So I'm asking what kind of mechanism are you going to propose for this idea? It's an interesting idea, but you need to put into account the uh, potential uh, loss from these ca tree countries who have the so. trees when they are forced to keep the trees in, in, in a compensation of money. Uh, yeah, what I'm, what I'm talking about really is maintaining intact natural forests. So I'm not saying that people that live in the forest shouldn't be able to do what they've traditionally done there. Obviously, the forests are still intact. Whatever's been going on has been fine. And I would hope that the benefits of paying to maintain that environment and that livelihood and lifestyle that has persisted to date would actually flow to those communities. That's the sort of thing that I'm, I'm thinking of. And I think that's the sort of thing that uh, when um, people in developed countries hear about this, um, problem and want to deliver some money somehow via their government or however it happens to uh, try and help out by keeping these ecosystems. That's the sort of thing they're thinking of. I do understand issues around, you know, fear of dispossession and um, that this is another form well, of yeah. commodification. Yeah. In a sense, it is commodification, but if it's um, done with the right sort of safeguards and um, that thought process about uh, maintaining what has historically been, been that's yeah, worked. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Excellent. And there'll be a lot more of that in the session. So thank you very much, panelists. A big cheer of applause for them. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, um, super answers. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, still have a very exciting program ahead of us. We've got two lunchtime learning events taking place downstairs on the fire and haze and another one on the future of forestry research and education. For those wanting to attend those events, lunch